Mm -hmm. Alexi, yeah. Phyllis Cassidy. Okay. And Michael Weidmann. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ellie. Okay. 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 And this is uh, all mathematicians, not the computer yeah. scientists? Yeah. Just always called me okay. Weidmann. All mathematicians. This is Ray Hoopla. Okay. We're just doing introductions, I asked for a job. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the key? <laughs> well, since we're just doing introductions, I'm going to move over there. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay so let's start. Uh, so welcome to George Laman from the University of Waterloo. He's going to talk about the environments of final groups. Oops. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, I've had a very nice time in New York. I gave a talk yesterday, and uh, uh, it's nice to see sort of people still come today. So that was good. <laughs> it wasn't such a disaster yesterday. It's good. Uh, I like to talk about rational invariance of uh, finite abelian groups and sort of a little bit of applications of uh, this work. And this is joint work of uh, Evelyn Hubert from Maria Meritlain. Uh, Evelyn's quite well known for her work in invariance and uh, a number of other topics in computer algebra. So my setup is as follows. I'm going to have a finite abelian group. Uh, abelian groups are very special, of course. Finite abelian groups are very special. It's going to be a group of finite abelian group of matrices. And they're going to have, so, and of course, these sort of act on uh, sort of in coordinates, uh, some sort of coordinate space, uh, in dimensional coordinate space in a natural way. Right? Uh, just take your, any element, just a matrix, multiply the matrix by the the vector, and so you get something else. So basically, we're going to take some components and uh, uh, transform them linearly. Okay. So what we're going to do in this case is we're going to construct something called rational invariance of this action. And uh, rational invariant is basically any rational function such that uh, when you plug in uh, your uh, coordinates, uh, or if you apply any element uh, of the, the group to the coordinates, the, the, the thing stays the same. So you can think of, for example, the finite group as being a, a cyclic group of permutations represented as matrices. And uh, uh, so a rational invariant is something where you, know, you have certain, uh, it's a function of a certain number of components and uh, produce the result, uh, permute the, the components, you get the same thing. Uh, furthermore, at some level, what we want to do is we want to decide when, when something is invariant, uh, uh, at some level, uh, uh, we view this as a, a function that is sort of, you can think of it as, let's work modulo the action. And in order to do that, you want to sort of take your, you know, whatever you have and rewrite it in terms of these invariants. So then it allows you to work modulo the action. So it's kind of a, uh, starting off with integers, working integers mod p, doing stuff down there. But the, the how do you work integers mod p is not so clear. And uh, furthermore, we want to show how to use this. So we want to, uh, for example, given a system polynomial equations, which appear in many, many places, uh, and, and of course are the simplest set of nonlinear systems of equations. If I have a group action, a finite abelian group action, then how do I reduce this polynomial system as if I'm working modulo of that group? Do a, a work there and somehow come back. And conversely, if I have a, a if I have a poem system equations, maybe what I want to do is uh, uh, is I want to say let's see if there is a finite abelian group action, and and if so, then I can do that process of work uh, modulo that that action, uh, uh, work with invariance, solve the system and come back. So either I'm given a finite abelian group, or I can determine. It. And I give plenty of examples. This talk is actually a report on a paper by Evan and myself on rational invariance of finite abelian groups. This uh, to appear in Mathematics of Computation. And uh, so it's basically what I'm going to talk about uh, all day today. And then, uh, or all morning, I uh, Relevant other publications in, in, come from Karen Gaderman, ISAC uh, 1999, or 1990, well back, where she talked about using uh, group actions to reduce Grobner basis computation. 
and Jean-Charles Fougere and a student Jules Schwartz from ISAC 2013, where we talked about using abelian group actions to reduce polynomial systems, but mainly, again, they're working with uh, gravity basis computations. And then two papers from Evelyn and myself, uh, which appeared in ISAC 2012 and in the journal uh, Foundations of Computational Math in 2013, on scaling symmetries, which are related. So let me start off with an example. It should be an easy example for everybody. Uh, uh, I have a system of polynomial equations, three equations, uh, three variables, uh, nonlinear. But it, it actually, it's, uh, probably everybody can recognize this is a pretty simple system. Okay. Uh, uh, what you should recognize right away is that solution space is invariant under a, sort of an order three permutation. Flip x1 and x2, x2, x3, x3, x1, and, and you get the same thing. Matter of fact, uh, I, I, you get the same thing for each equation, but, but that's not necessarily the case. If the whole, if the system is just invariant under that, that's fine for us too. Okay, our goal again is to work modulo the order three permutation. It should make sense. Right? If it's sort of a, a society set up, or if if an application is set up so that, that something is invariant under the, you know, moving these coordinates, then in some sense it's natural to say, well, then, then, then really there, there's something underlying that sort of should, should be independent of, of this permutation. You should be able to work with that and, and then work backwards. So that's a pretty natural thing. Go ahead. Can you rephrase somehow the set of questions as saying that you are studying finite abelian endomorphism groups of varieties? You have to remember I'm a computer scientist, and so I remember the word endomorphism and things like that because I start off as a pure mathematician, but I don't think that way anymore. So I, I can't necessarily reword that uh, okay. without sort of having to really think about it, if that makes sense to me. Okay. It's probably correct. Okay. Any other questions? So what we do is, first of all, we find some invariance, and, and, and if you look at the uh, y1, y2, y3, which I put in a matrix form, they're all sort of uh, invariant under this group action. You can flip around x1, x2, x2, x3, x3, x1, and really y1, y2, y3 do not change. Okay. You notice that uh, uh, these invariants somehow involve a primitive cube root of unity, so we have to sort of explain that, or that should come up naturally sometimes. Uh, and, of course, uh, how the hell do you get these invariants? So, you know, it's not trivial, it's not sort of obvious that... Uh, it's obvious that these are invariants, but it's not obvious that these are good invariants, or, or anything like that. Or how do I pull these out of my head? So I have to explain that. Uh, then I rewrite the system in terms of these invariants, and again, that's not uh, obvious. So I take my original polynomial system, rewrite it in this other system. Go ahead. Uh, we look at finite dimensional things, yes. Yeah. So we look at finite dimensional varieties. Finite uh, dimensional, not zero dimensional. Zero dimensional, I'm sorry. Zero oh, dimensional. Yeah. Yeah. I always get that confused. <laughs> but, uh, uh, finite set of groups and zero dimensional. Finite. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's always something that. Uh, I'm not a Grabner basis person, but uh, so I just, a few things I can get. Uh, there's some things you should notice, though, that uh, at some level I've rewritten the system in terms of these invariants, which sort of means that I could work modulo this uh, cyclic group of uh, permutations. Uh, these are no longer polynomials. That's something that, and, and that can create sort of issues when you're solving these, because now if I look at that system, I now have to separate y1 equals to zero, y1 not equals to zero, and something which I didn't need to do in my initial system. But it's, not clear. It, okay. it's not clear that you don't need to say y1 um, not equal to zero, even if, I mean, y1 was substituted for some expression there, right? So when you try to solve the original system, uh, you may have to say that. You don't know. Yeah, it, it could be some conditions. Uh, uh, but but uh, in any, uh, at some level, it, it, I'm just sort of saying that this, uh, although at some level this should be simpler, there are, there are added complications to doing this reduction. But, so, so, so I've really sort of reduced it, modulo the, the cubic, uh, uh, the, the cyclic group. Uh, I've got not necessarily a polynomial system of equations. I've got a system of equations which should be, should have less solutions. It should have the order of the finite abelian group less solutions. 
and I do in this case. In this case, uh, I can uh, solve this uh, polynomial system of equations, uh, uh, or this uh, rational uh, sort of uh, uh, equations, and I can get uh, uh, two solutions. And then I can work backwards somehow. Not obvious how to work backwards. Somehow and get six solutions. In fact, they go back on, on orbits. So you can you can think easily if you have a matrix equation. Uh, uh, what often what can you do with matrix equation? Quite often you you sort of go to a normal form. You go to a, 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 a draw a normal form, something like that. You, you sort of have a much easier system of equations. You solve that and then you go back with the symmetry or the uh, Ordinary scale. Okay, so, so that's sort of a, an example of what I'm going to try and, and convince you is possible. As a matter of fact, I'm going to convince you it's really not very hard at all. So, I mean, I guess my worry is that, uh, uh, I mean, this might be too easy to understand. Okay, so the, uh, I apologize. Nothing is. Okay. No, it's, it's actually uses very basic tools, uh, tools that are available in computer algebra systems, uh, uh, any computer algebra system. Okay, so here's the process. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my whatever I have. Uh, uh, I've written everything in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, things in terms of, say, x. I'm going to change coordinates. I'm going to talk about something called scaling action because the change of coordinates is going to make the the, the, the finite abelian group action really look different and really looks simpler. Finite abelian groups are really very special. They're actually very easy groups. And, and it's going to allow me to do sort of some arithmetic of exponents. And I'm going to show you how to do that with integer linear algebra. Again, it's, uh, everything is, uh, tools are available in any computer algebra system, very simple. And very, you know, you can teach this to a third year undergraduate without any troubles at all. And then I'm going to show you how to polynomial systems. I'm going to sort of show you how to how it solve, uh, you know, reducing, working backwards, and then I'm going to talk all this over. Uh, uh, if you have the group, this works, and if you don't have the group, we can at least try and see if we can find one for it. Can you use this to do the case of a cyclic by cyclic extension? Uh, what do you mean cyclic by cyclic extension? So a group with a cyclic subgroup, okay. finite a solvable abelian sort of subgroup, thing? and its quotient group is okay. finite abelian with the alpha group itself being. You mean like a solvable group? No, no, no. So, so, so I'd like to. Uh, so it's, right now I can't. It's just got to be a, a, a finite abelian state. And, and I can play around with uh, solvable groups, but I sort of haven't been yet been able to extend this. Uh, it, You'll see that everything is it's very special to be uh, uh, this finite abelian group. And, and, uh, sort of working out a chain of this is, is not quite, doesn't really fit yet. Okay. So, somehow, if you do this, uh, if you do this once okay. to a system, it would be hard to do it again to the system? Uh, so far, it's been hard to do this system. Yeah, I just want to. Okay. And I'll try to explain why as we go. So, so the process is going to be, so let's just uh, do a nice example with a cubic, uh, 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 with a cyclic permutation. Uh, what I'm going to do is just do a change of coordinates, like a Fourier transform, uh, from my initial uh, set of coordinates to sort of a, you can view it as frequency, but it's really, doesn't make much sense, but it is like a Fourier transform. From one set of coordinates uh, uh, in x to another set of coordinates in z. And this is where a primitive cube of unity comes in naturally. Okay, the polynomial system with this change of coordinates now looks, now I'm going to rewrite it in terms of z. Of course, I would you know, invert that matrix first and write it in terms of z. Uh, and proceed, right? If you chose this particular. Coordinates transform uh, for this specific system. This for this specific system, right. general for an arbitrary. No, in general, you, you do like a Fourier transform, yes, because it's a, that's a transform that diagonalizes the abelian group. Okay, thank you. So that's what I'm trying okay. to do. Okay. I'm, I'm diagonalizing the abelian group. Mm -hmm. so because, uh, every, any finite abelian group uh, uh, can be, all these matrices can be simultaneously diagonalized. That's the point. 
that's the key, and that's why finite abelian groups work. <coughs> in this case, it's very easy. To, yeah. So I, I diagonalize the group <coughs> via this transform. Writing z in terms of uh, writing x in terms of z, I can replace my initial polynomial system. I've got now a polynomial system of z. Everything is still easy. Here I don't see uh, uh, the, the primitive cube root of unity, but of course it could come up. So that's very natural. But in this case, it doesn't. Okay, one of the key points is what does the group action now look like? What is the action of you know, taking your, your uh, uh, variables and sticking x1 to x2, x2 to x3, x3 to x1. In fact, if this change of coordinates is the same thing as taking the z's and multiplying by sort of this generator of this cubic, uh, uh, this primitive cubic thing. And, and so it turns out now the action is the same thing as instead of permuting the variables, you take your variables and you, you, you rescale the first variable by this uh, primitive root, uh, which is a generator of this uh, group of order three, you, you rescale the second coordinate in terms of uh, uh, a little different, and you rescale the third one, but in this case, the rescaling the third one is just leave it alone. Okay. Could you put your system equations in C again? Okay, no problem. There's nothing special about them, the way they look. Why didn't you substitute the second equation into the first and uh, simplify the first equation? Oh, I could have. No, no, no. And the reason I didn't is because, don't forget, this is, let me just go back. Uh, okay. And, and let me sort of say that that first system equation can definitely be uh, uh, extremely simplified. But you have to remember, that system of equations is extremely contrived. So everything works out nicely. And that's it, right? I, mean, I could certainly solve this in an easier way than this. I just want to show you how to solve it in this particular way. I mean, these are all sort of basic elementary symmetric functions. You know, so everything's real. Uh, you, know, you can recognize this, but just don't. Just if the, I mean, I have a system of polynomial equations. They, you know, you don't know anything about them. Well, gee, it looks sure it has this uh, process. And then I, I just sort of follow this other process. And I now sort of change it to something that looks more complicated. So the, Fourier, looks more complicated. the Fourier, the Fourier uh, change uh -huh. is independent of your system, but only depends on the group. Depends it? on the group. Okay. Well, I'm trying to diagonalize the group. Depends on the group. The group, group. No, yeah, the group action. So okay. it's not just, it depends not just on the what the group says in morphics. Right. No, no, it, it's right. It depends, but it, it depends entirely on the finite ability group. On the embedding of the GLN, yeah. That's right, exactly, that's right. Yeah. That's, 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 okay. So again, the, this looks more complicated, but while that may look more complicated, the group action looks kind of simple. It really just takes your variables and rescales them. So that's always the case? And that's always the case. That's right. and so we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll do it more general. I mean, uh, don't forget, remember, I'm in computer science, so you always start off with a simple example <laughs> in computer science, and then you do the more general things. Go ahead. Oh, never mind, sorry. Okay. Again, it's finer than the other. It's very, very simple. Extremely simple. Everything depends on finer than the other. Yeah, you need to be reminded that the variety is zero direction. Right. Okay. Okay. So that's fine. And, uh, 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 and so, you know, uh, let's say it's like rescaling. And, and, and for example, uh, notice that in this, uh, I, I can kind of probably guess a few rational invariant functions. For example, if I take the second coordinate and divide by the square of the first, uh, that the, uh, uh, and then do this action, nothing happens to that object. I can take the second coordinate and just cube it. And since I have a primitive third root of unity, it means that when I apply this action, it remains the same. And of course, I can multiply all the coordinates together. Okay. And because I've got a, a, a primitive root of unity, it means that nothing changes. So all three of them are easily checked that they're invariant under this action. Okay. Right. Why make that choice rather than judging by the system that you were putting up? It looks like you want to be able to recognize that Z1, Z2 
is an invariant. Okay. Uh, 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 excellent question. You know, actually, when you have questions and they're good questions, and it's not so bad to give a talk. You know, uh, <laughs> I don't need to interrupt the, the audience. <laughs> uh, so, 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 so the, the question is, you know, like I, I've given you some invariants, and I really only gave you invariants because, you know, it's easy to check that they're invariant uh, uh, under this transformation. But it's not the only one. Matter of fact, there's also another set of invariants. In this case here, there, it's another set of rational invariants. Now, it turns out that they're all polynomial. So it's a little bit simpler. But again, so it's easy looking, to check. So what you're looking for is a basis for the invariant. Yeah, I like that. That's right. Basically. And this looks like a better basis than the previous This looks one. like a better basis. It's a polynomial basis. Yeah. Exactly. That's right. and, uh, and so there you can see if you cube the, the first coordinate, uh, then certainly everything remains invariant. If you multiply the first two coordinates together, certainly everything remains invariant. And if you leave the third one alone, everything uh, it's invariant because nothing happens, and this action says nothing happens. But there is an algorithm to find the basis, correct? Oh, absolutely. So that's what I have to show. So, so here I've just pulled them out of a hat, and sort of said, here I pulled one out of a hat, and it's this one, and, and as pointed out in the audience, here's another one which I also just pulled out of a hat, but it seems to be a little bit better. But isn't there an algorithm actually for an uh, arbitrary action of an algebraic group, so it doesn't have to be finite or even, but for uh, any more complicated yeah. action given by a group of matrices. Yeah, I believe that's it's, the case. It's always given by polynomial equations. Uh, I, 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 I'm not so sure, but it, it could easily be true. But I mean, in this case, but I mean, there's there's rational invariance and there's polynomial invariance, right? So they have different objects. Mm -hmm. so these are right. we start off with polynomials, but we're not finding polynomial invariance. We're finding yeah. rational invariance. Mm -hmm. so that's a little different. Rational variants turn out to be a little bit easier on a topic. So, how could we pass uh, reductive? So, in this case, somehow all the rational invariants can be what they call deduced from the polynomial invariants. Does it happen that. No, not. Uh, I, I, it turns out that all rational invariants can be, can, can be determined by these three yes. polynomial invariants. Yes. Right. And in general, that's true too for finite event groups. But but these aren't but these aren't polynomial invariants. These are just rational invariants who are polynomial. It's different. Wait, what's the distinction? These are not polynomial invariants. These are not sort of you can have a, a poly, so they don't generate the set of all polynomial invariants. They generate the set of rational invariants. Because when you generate rational invariants, you're also allowed to divide. You're also allowed to divide. Okay, but what my question was, if you look at the set of rational invariants for some system, mm -hmm. is it always true that the polynomials amongst those no. generate No, it's not always true. Uh -huh. uh, as a matter of fact, one of the goals that we have is to, to try and determine when we have something like a scaling action is when can we get a polynomial action? When can we describe the action by polynomials? When is there polynomial <coughs> invariant? A rational invariant, which is polynomial. Do you have an example where you have rational invariants but no polynomials? Uh, we have examples, sure. That's, that's, uh, uh, in the case of scaling actions, not in the case of finite abelian actions. In the case of finite abelian group actions, you always find a polynomial. And I'll, I'll sh demonstrate that, no troubles. Again, I use very simple tools. Uh, if you have time to give the example where it doesn't happen. In the, sure, uh, I, the scaling uh, synthesis, I should be able to generate. Any other questions? Okay, so also, so again, I have a, a, the, the case that the, we have group action, we have some variants, and how do we read a polynomial system in terms of these invariants? It's still not so clear. Right? Uh, I have some variants, but how do I rewrite everything in terms of z1 cubed, z1 times z2, and z3? It may be obvious in a particular equation, but in fact, it's not so obvious at all. So in this case, uh, uh, group action looks like, uh, uh, again, I repeat up there, just rescaling in the first coordinate, two coordinates, leave the third one alone. And you notice if you take any monomial, you take any sort of combination of z1, z2, z3 to certain exponents, then, and you apply the action, you'll see, in, in fact, that you can kind of pull out some quantities. Uh, it really depends on the exponents uh, of the monomial. Okay. And a matter of fact, uh, it's sort of, 
you can take the exponents, and, and you really, it's a rational variant, if only if you have a sort of a sort of curtain of kernel operation. So you're going to work with exponents, and you're going to work uh, sort of finding the kernel modulo certain primes. And the prime is typically the order. It's the kernel is determined to be integer in your operation on exponents. Again, I doubt if anyone's going to find that difficult. Uh, we'll have to do the more general case, but uh, you'll see it's a little more complicated, but not so bad. And rewrite rules reverse such kernel operations, and so they're also to very easy to determine at the end. What do you mean reverse kernel operations? Well, so I, I, I do some transformations to determine what the kernel is, okay. and, and so that uh, uh, and then I have to sort of, so I, I generate the kernel, and, and, and so the kernel, the, these, the, the exponents from the kernel will tell me the invariance, but then I still need to somehow sort of reverse that process if I want to work backwards. If I have the, all the, 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 the monomials in terms of exponents which are in the kernel, how do I sort of work backwards? So how do I, uh, if I have the z's with the proper exponents, and they give me the y's. If now I have the y's, how do I get the z's? So how do I reverse that process? How do I take monomials in the in the y's and, and give individual z's? And again, continue with this uh, simple example. So my original transform system is there. Uh, I've got some rational invariants, y1 and y2 and y3 in terms of the z's. I can reverse that. Uh, here I've got fractional powers. Doesn't seem to be what we want, but that's fine. Uh, uh, let's just let that go for the time being. Uh, I can rewrite the rational uh, system, though, by replacing the z's with the rewrite rules. And it turns out, because they're rational invariants, there are no more fractional exponents. They're all integer exponents. So that's sort of something that uh, must happen. So, so it turns out I can rewrite the system. So, so the from here to here is what I meant about reversing. So here it turns out that these exponents come from a certain kernel, and here I reverse this, and there's a process to reverse this. And, and, uh, uh, and I need the rewrite rules because I need to write everything in terms of the, the, uh, the particular invariant systems. The reverse is just the inverse of the matrix, right? Basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, and, so I've got a matrix of integers, now I've got a matrix of rational numbers. But it's a special, but uh, it's a special operation because again, when I rewrite things, uh, uh, the rational numbers are going to disappear, and there's there's a very specific set of rational numbers. So that's sort of the process, and so the general process that I'm going to describe is going to be this Fourier step, which really is basically a diagonal, a, a sort of a simultaneous diagonalization of everybody in this finite billion group. Uh, the process of finite group plus diagonalization is going to mean that, that my group operation is like a rescaling of the coordinates. And, and, and that's going to sort of uh, introduce sort of both the, the, uh, the exponent, uh, uh, a matrix of exponents that I'm going to have to work with, and uh, 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 sort of a matrix of orders because things are done modulo a certain order, which I'll demonstrate shortly. Rational invariance is then the kernel of the exponent plus order matrix, and that's going to involve integer linear algebra. There's other ways to do it, but integer linear algebra turns out to be, uh, the way we do it is very simple. And rewrite rules, again, is a, inverting these kernels in this funny, quote, way. Right? So what you really mean by inverting the kernels is inverting the matrices whose kernels you were discussing in the previous item. Right, right. I mean, okay. at some level, you have to remember, from I mean, computer science, uh, we can keep uh, these things much more vague if we can about the typical math. So what, what does order mean here? Order means uh, the same thing as, uh, so for example, in the, this, uh, in the case of the cyclic group, the order was three. It's just the size oh, okay. at some level. But in a finite building group, you have sort of these, uh, you can break up any finite building group into sort of basically, you know, ZP1, ZP2, and so you've got different orders, P1, P2. Okay, so, so, so let's just start off with the, uh, 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 we'll describe this process a bit more in general. So we'll take a finite being group, uh, a subgroup of the, of the matrices. 
This order will be a product of primes. It doesn't even need to be a product of primes, just a product of some relatively prime integers. Then uh, the statement, go ahead, please. You don't assume that the primes are distinct. Uh, I, I'm going to assume that P1 through the PS are distinct oh. and relatively prime. Oh. Um, okay. So you can deal with finite abelian groups of one and four? Uh, that shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's not a problem. There's nothing a uh, problem. There's no problem with that. Mm -hmm. So how do you write four as a product of distinct primes? Uh, uh, no, no, P1 is not. P, the P's aren't primes. P, so, so, so uh, uh, again, you know, uh, 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 it could be powers, typically they're powers of primes. Well, no, it's, it's a problem of being a computer scientist. You know, P just stands for things besides primes, right? And so uh, uh, it's just like I and J are indices for loops, right? They're not complex numbers, and uh, uh, complex, I being complex numbers for... Uh, mathematicians, J being complex numbers for uh, engineers. engineers, right? So, so and they, they sort of differ in, in this. So. So, but, but it's true, I, I could have used perhaps a little better notation. Okay, so, so basically the statement, uh, we want to start off, remind everybody that the so, matrix so, is so diagonal. Should, should I say that the PIs are relatively prime, pairwise? Yes. Yeah, relatively prime. Okay. Yes. 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 And so in the example that you mentioned first, so P is equal to uh, 2 squared P1. Right. Okay, so, so the, the group is diagonalizable, so there exists a matrix R where basically if I multiply, if I, if I take a, 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 a similarity transform of, of every element, uh, then, then what happens is I end up with sort of something which is simultaneously diagonalizable. Again, this is nice because this is what linear algebra 2 or 3, I think you can remember. So again, you can describe this to a second and third year uh, student in uh, uh, it's quite great about it, actually. It's a very nice one. And, and so, anyway, I have a one matrix, and this is a 4A matrix. Go ahead. Your only working characteristic is zero. Car yeah, a wrong and working characteristic is zero. So, yeah, so there's, there's an issue if uh, uh, that this could all screw up in characteristic non zero. Yeah. yeah. And it's not just there, it's it. you can actually find it, right? Yeah. Hmm? You can actually find R. You can actually find R, yeah, because it's, uh, uh, it's a matrix of uh, eigen, uh, 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 eigenvectors, basically. So that's right. So it's not just sort of a matter of that, uh, 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 that you know, you can understand how to find it. You can actually find this. You know, it's again, linear algebra two or three. Okay, so, so what happens is when I then do the change of transformation from x to r times z, uh, then my whole action sort of says, okay, look, I have a bunch of diagonal matrices, d1 through dn, or a, diagonal, uh, a, a typical diagonal matrix, applied to some coordinates, are now just sort of rescale individual uh, components. So that's what the action is. Take your z1 through zn, take a diagonal matrix, apply it, and all I'm doing is just rescaling the diagonal, the coordinates. Very simple. So uh, that's nice. Simple is nice. Okay, and so uh, what, what about, uh, uh, what is uh, a typical, if you've got a finite abelian group, then, then in fact uh, 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 any finite abelian group is a, uh, you know, can be broken down into uh, uh, group ZP1, uh, uh, direct sum of uh, uh, ZPS, or break down these numbers. And, and, and in fact there's an isomorphism between any uh, uh, finite abelian group and, and this particular, uh, 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 that a typical binary abelian group. And you can represent that isomorphism explicitly by uh, exponents. So you can take any element in, inside the ZP1 cross uh, all the way to ZPS, think of them as exponents, and, and, and then you can create, uh, uh, you have a number of diagonal matrices and raised to the exponents, and so that's a nice isomorphism. What it means, is that uh, uh, if I look really what, a, what does the diagonal action do, it sort of again multiplies every diagonal, every, it rescales every component, but the scaling actually depends on sort of a, a, a number of different exponents, not just the one. So in the example we chose at the beginning, we had a single generator. Now we have more than generators, we have sort of S generators, and so we have S exponents. 
And these are going to be the exponents that are going to sort of form into a matrix. There's going to be some exponents for the first scaling, some exponents for the second scaling, some exponents for all the scaling. So there's a matrix of exponents. Okay. And it's going to be the number of rows of this matrix are going to be uh, uh, the number of generators. And the number of columns is going to be the number of uh, uh, variables. Okay. And don't forget, everything is kind of modulo. So this one would be modulo P1. This would be modulo PS. So you have to also take a little care there. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about notation. Uh, you know, if you're going to talk, uh, first of all, if you have this diagonal action, let's just take a simple thing of uh, a group of order seven cross group of order five. And I'm going to take five components. I'm going to sort of say, okay, look, I've got two generators. So I've got a group of finite bidding group of order 35. Uh, I'm going to rescale all the coordinates. And the, uh, and the rescaling really depend, is going to be really defined by what I do to the generators. Okay, and so there, sort of I rescale. And, and, and uh, the first one, I'm only going to have the first generator, of, uh, uh, and the second generator is not going to be there. Second one's, second generator is going to be there. First one's not. And the third one, fourth one, fifth one, combining a little bit. And I'm going to take all of these the exponents of, of, of all these scalings, and again, I'm going to, I'm going to put them into a matrix. Okay. And I'm going to keep track of the fact that some apps are keep track of orders at the same time. Okay, so that's just sort of the things I have to keep track of. And so my notation, of course, is I'm going to take the matrix of exponents. I've got some generators. I'm going to write it in exponent form. It's just easy. And so uh, that's fine. Uh, uh, and this is just going to mean, you know, for whatever column I have, take the, exponent, take the generators and combine them with the exponents. So here I've got the uh, generators alpha and beta, and I use this for the exponents. So it's, it's what you would expect, notation wise. Go ahead. Would it not make more sense to transpose A? Because then at least alpha beta to the A is really, in some sense, matrix Top multiplication. Yeah. Uh, we're comfortable with this one because of the way, way it worked out through. Okay, I'll, I'll show you an example of where, why we're comfortable with this particular one. And, we use, uh, uh, and, and since we also wanted to sort of somehow look at that type of, uh, uh, of transformation, we also wanted to sort of take the exponents and combine them with uh, uh, some variables. And so we used sort of a star notation for pointwise uh, multiplication. Dot uh, product. Uh, hmm? Dot product. No, not dot product, because I'm not adding them. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. 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 So it's uh, uh, more decision. Sort of Hadamard product or something like that that has this. Uh, anyway, point, it's pointwise multiplication. Pointwise multiplication yeah, that, that right. makes it this. So. Okay, so those are the notational things, and uh, and I can use some ex properties of the exponent. Uh, I happen to not include it. I, I should have included it as the next slide, but that's fine. Uh, I'll describe what what happens. There, so. so now I'm going to take my finite bidding group actions. I'm going to talk about rational invariance. I'm going to talk a little bit about integer linear algebra. We're going to talk a little bit about the regulars. So rational invariance again. Uh, I, so now my action we're going to have everything be in terms of these new coordinates, these z's. Uh, my action is going to be take my uh, 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 generators from the, that make up the finite billion group, a uh, certain set of exponents, <coughs> point ways multiply them with the uh, uh, coordinates, so it's like a scaling. Uh, it's uh, a rational, uh, uh, rational function is invariant if, when you apply it to this new coordinates, nothing happens, nothing changes. Okay? And if you paid attention to, for example, uh, if I just sort of said, well, here's a rational function. Uh, let's just take uh, zv, where v is a, a vector, and, and it could be a vector of integers, positive or negative. And I'll just apply that to the, the you know, z1 through to zn by having this vector be the exponents. <coughs> okay, so, so in fact, when is that invariant? Okay, when is it sort of a monomial expression invariant? And it turns out that that's the same statement as 
Okay, what happens when you rescale the, the, the components with these as their powers? And when is it sort of the same as, when it does it remain unchanged? And, and in fact, what happens is, the way we use notation, this V can actually go through. Okay, and so what happens then is it, ha uh, it means that ZV, this is ZV uh, uh, star uh, lambda AV. And so it remains unchanged when AV is zero, at least modulo the, the set of prompts. Okay? A kernel. Yeah. Uh, it's so simple. Yeah, it's so simple. It's just what, what's, what's kind of nice about it, right? So now it's a little bit more challenging in general. Okay, so first of all, a kernel comes up. Kernel mod P comes up, and so we're going to have to deal with that. And furthermore, in general, what is a rational invariant? So it's a, a, an expression numerator and denominator. It has uh, some exponents, some constants. It turns out that yeah, the exponents must all come from this kernel mod P. So you just can't have any sort of rational function in general. It turns out you can have a, the rational function must have sort of only exponents that, that, that come from this kernel mod P. You can prove that. It's not trivial. You can, it takes a little bit of effort to prove that. But uh, uh, if it turns out that if you have any term which isn't in the kernel, uh, you can always divide top and bottom by that one, uh, uh, but you must end up having kernels when you form the ratios. And this is a little bit why rational variants are kind of a little bit special, because again, you can divide things. Yeah. So that makes things, uh, uh, you can play with the exponents a little bit. Go ahead, please. And um, I guess since you're working mod P, uh, you might just as well take the Vs from um, uh, from the naturals, rather take take only positive views. I'm not so clear yet, but uh, it'll be true for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, in, in the top line, more. at least. Yeah. Pardon me? Yeah. At least in the top line. Uh, I mean, not to get the economy, but uh, uh, it should be true. Yeah, yeah, yeah it should be true. It's more p. Yeah, yeah, in my p, it's certainly yeah, true. Yeah. P, so you can keep yeah, in general, if you didn't have the mod p, it's not so clear. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. And so that's what happens with scaling. That's why I said in scaling, uh, ordinary scalings, where you don't have the mod p, uh, uh, you don't necessarily have uh, positive exponents all the time. Because this kernel, you can't just take positive values. Okay. okay. So how am I going to compute this kernel? I mean, so again, I have a matrix of integers. I want to find the kernel modulo p. And so, so let me do a simpler case of. Uh, uh, of two groups, uh, I'm going to only have three coordinates this time. I'm going to have uh, two generators. Uh, uh, it's going to come group of, group of eight, uh, or 18. And uh, uh, so I'm going to take sort of the exponent matrix, some exponents and, and some orders together. But the six and three are not relevant to be prime, are they? It doesn't need, they don't, they, well, OK, so this is just, uh, I could have chosen a better example. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yes, I, I, I hate it when I'm inconsistent. <laughs> but usually nobody, nobody asks questions. <laughs> uh, in computer science, it's, nobody asks questions. They're all very polite and just hope they can stay awake for the entire lecture. Okay. <laughs> so it seems to be a different seminar. Here, so. I'm quite fond of this seminar. <laughs> okay, so I'm taking, I'm going to take this, uh, uh, I'm going to take this uh, uh, diagonal, uh, uh, this matrix of exponents in, in order, and I'm going to try and find the kernel. Kernel mod P, which is, uh, I'm going to transform this matrix. What I'm going to do is I'm going to compute the Hermit normal form. So I'm going to convert that using some column operations until I get the matrix on the right. And of course, it's, uh, I, you know, I'm going to do column operations, but I'm going to do only integer operations. So I can do transformations, but I mean, I, I, I can't use, I can't divide. Questions? So, on the left, if I understand your color coding. The, the green is basically the, the exponent, and the A, or the, the, the order, oh, and, and A. But at some level, I'm going to just say this is a matrix of That's integers. Good. So, okay. so somehow, when, when you're finding this Hermit normal form, yeah. whatever it is, yeah. uh, you are scrambling the green and the red numbers. Yeah. Yep. that were serving very different purposes. Right, exactly. 
this way. Yeah. Yeah. There's no question that uh, at some level, I mean, I start off with some exponents for the generators, and I uh, uh, continue with the order. I combine the two into a single matrix. I play with the exponents. So what does it? What does it actually mean? In trying to solve the uh, integer system A, B, equals In trying to solve the integer system A, B, uh, so A, B minus uh, P, W equals to zero, that's right. And, so, and then we work in mod P, it means I really have the first root. Okay. 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 So, so, so uh, uh, what happens is I'm going to do some column operations, integer column operations, which, uh, I mean, if you want to do the Hermit normal form in its crudest form, Hermit normal form dates back. 1851, I think, if I remember. Uh, you do, uh, you, you, you uh, cancel things by uh, basically extending Euclidean algorithm uh, combinations, right? So, so you can't do the sort of standard divide uh, stuff, but you know, there, it's possible to do integer elimination. And, and now what happens... You can't divide even if the, uh, the order of the secret group is prime? Can't divide. Can't divide. Because at this stage, uh, these are no. This is no longer a cyclic group, and this is no longer exponents. These are just integers. Just integers. Just integers. Okay. I'm just going to take these integers and do column operations, and, and I'm going to make. So it you're not doing mod p or anything. No, no, I'm not doing oh. anything. Oh. I'm just doing integer Does operations. Right. Integer operations that are all reversible. Right. Uh, and so that's the right. key. Integer right. operations all reversible. Mm -hmm. Could you show me this slide again? Pardon me? The previous slide. Slide? Yeah. Other previous slide. Or this this one? Okay. It's kind of independent. It's just this slide only tells you that the kernel mod P must enter somehow into the, your way of thinking. Yeah. Okay. So, so so that's the, 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 the key point there. So so this is the sufficient to find in the elements that are uh, the normal form, right? It turns out that it is sufficient to find uh, uh, invariance of monomial form. That's right. But that's not obvious. So, so, so let's see, that's not obvious. So, so it, it does turn out to be that case. That's right. So in your second lemma, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the exponents uh, are, could still be negative, right? Even in a, well, the exponents even could be in negative? numerator Absolutely. or denominator. Absolutely, that's right. These are integer exponents. That's right. So even, the, even what you call numerator is not polynomial, possibly. Exactly. Yeah, so, so that's right. So these are just sort of rational values. But I, as mentioned so before, but you certainly can so take certainly it so that these are all positive. So, so yeah. certainly they're not unique. They're not unique. Yeah. But, but you know, we can kind of make them unique. Yeah. Uh, you'll see. Yeah, yeah. We've covered, yeah. We, we cover a lot of bases. That's right. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. So let's see the script again. Okay, so, so, so what I do then is I do sort of some column operations. And so the column operations will be in a matrix form. These are matrix of integers. It turns out this matrix uh, can be divided in the same way that you start off with an exponent uh, matrix, an order matrix. I can sort of uh, keep track of the fact that uh, uh, I have some parts that would be applying, would be multiplying the, the, uh, the exponent, some, uh, some things that are applying the order, some things that end up with non-zero entries and some things that end up with zero entries. Okay. The things that end up with zero entries, we like to call the kernel, right. okay, okay. all the way back from when we were you know, at first university. And uh, so that uh, turns out nice. The matrix that we have is a unimodular uh, matrix, and that means that uh, basically its inverse is an integer matrix. So that nice. Now that matrix actually is Pretty special in this case. Uh, uh, it turns out that there's lots of ways to do these integer, opera uh, uh, integer operations to get this. So that's not unique. On the other hand, uh, I, you know, it's clearly not unique because I can I can do this and I can play around with a whole pile of column operations in the last three columns, and I'll still stay unimodular, and I'll still stay with this exact equation. So so this guy's not unique. But what I can do, though, is the following nifty little trick. I can uh, do the computation. I can then mess around with these all I want. Matter of fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put these into a hermit normal form. And the hermit normal form, actually, I didn't tell you what hermit normal form is. It's a triangular matrix, uh, uh, positive entries along the diagonal, 
positive entries everywhere. And uh, uh, on the rows, uh, uh, the diagonals are the dominant entries. So the three is bigger than the two in this case. You can always do that. You always have these diagonal entries. You can always diagonalize or triangulize. And you can make it, uh, uh, in this case, it's, we're going to ask for it to be upper triangular. Uh, and, and everybody, sort of the diagonal elements dominate every row. There's lots of variations of Herman now from this. Upper triangular versus lower triangular. There's, you know, there's, uh, uh, sometimes where these guys are at the end, sometimes the zeros are at the beginning. You know, there's a ton of different variations. So you end up choosing one and going with that. And so what we did is we sort of said, look, I can fool around with these last three columns. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that the top three by three matrix is in Hermit number four also. And then I'm going to make sure that in the same way that the diagonal entries have everything in the, the, the uh, previous row be less, I'm going to do the same thing to, to the guys in this one, because I can take these columns and I can certainly apply them uh, uh, to these columns without changing anything. I, I, I don't change the Herbert normal form at all. So this is going to be in Herbert normal form, at least the top part is. And furthermore, I'm going to then do some column operations so that the elements in each row also have this property, which are, is less than uh, the, uh, the diagonal entries. In, in that side. Okay. So, let me get this right. So, in the in the big matrix, okay. the red stuff you can't mess with. Uh, the red stuff you can't mess. You sort of can't mess with. I can mess okay. with with the blue stuff. You have, you have to be very careful to mess. You have to be very careful to mess but with the red with stuff. The, but with the blue stuff, you can mess as much as you want. As much and as you, you like. Do so to get the top square of the blue part to be in Hermit normal form, right. and then you're stuck. That's all you can do. That's so all you can do to the blue part? To the blue part. Okay. Because uh, 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 you can do in column operations, so, so with three columns, you really only can do sort of three yeah. operations. Mm -hmm. But I can still apply the blue stuff to the red stuff. Ah, okay. Thank you. And so that's where I'm going to lower the, mm -hmm. the orders a little bit, make it just a little bit easier for us. Mm -hmm. And the purpose for using this freedom is? Uh, first of all, uh, uh, um, to make it simpler, but also... Uh, 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 to get many more questions for the kernel, same reason we will reduce... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so, so, so I mean, I can, instead of using Herbert normal form, I can do something like LL, I can get some of the smallest elements. Mm -hmm. I can do it that way. But in this case, we like the Herbert normal form, and, and in fact, it's very important for us because the fact that it's triangular, uh, 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 and positive entries means that our invariants are all going to be polynomial because the, the invariants are going to come from that, that top matrix, so they're all positive, so they're all polynomial. And it's nice and triangular. And what do triangular matrices, what nice property do they have? You can sort of reduce to triangular and you can work backwards. And so when I go from rewrite rules to back, it's the triangular thing that's the, the big thing. When I'm looking, when I'm solving equations, and I, I reduce uh, mod uh, uh, the in, into invariant things. The invariants are going to be elements of this uh, exponents of this triangular thing. And when I come back, which is basically going along some orbits, uh, because it's in triangular form, I can go back very nicely. So that's uh, it's basically the, the rewrite rule aspect of it. So the triangular thing is very special. That's why we didn't choose the LLL form of uh, doing this. So the inversion is is very straightforward. And so that was what I tried to point out a little bit in this slide, is that the, 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 on the uh, last three columns, I'm in Herman number four, the diagonals are the dominant entries. Off diagonals have, uh, in each row, are less than the diagonal entries. Including, for example, less than one means everything's got to be zero. And so if the Herman norm form was the identity, everything is really easy. In fact, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, the identity, then it's, it's almost trivial. Okay. And everything else is zero. So why is the color changed? Oh, because I just want to emphasize the, the fact that the, to the emphasize the fact that the, the entries were less. In that case. Okay. Okay. 
and uh, so that was kind of and so it turns out this v uh, this the v is not unique, but you can normalize it and, and, and basically and then you can get something that's just kind of unique. And we're going to call this a, a sort of a a, a, a unimodular multiplier, but it's going to be sort of a normalized unimodular multiplier, and that turns out to be a very important element. Okay. And again, the, the key thing is that the, this Hermit normal form, uh, you can find this in, in any computer algebra system, no matter how basic. And, and you can code this up like in a half a day. So, you know, even making a ton of mistakes halfway through, it's still <laughs> just, it just, you can do it. So, so, and again, a second or third year student can do this. And you know, second or third year student who are interested in algebra will kind of have fun doing this. So it uses very basic tools, which is one of the, the things that we like about this. OK, so here is what uh, now happens is uh, uh, let's take our matrix of exponents, our matrix of orders. Let's put it in Hermit normal form with this normalized unimodular multiplier. Let's break down this uh, uh, unim unimodular matrix into sort of the part that looks like it's the image and the part that looks like it's in the null space. So that's where we do the, uh, and then there's the part that sort of the V's apply to the exponents, the, the P's apply to the, the order. And also there's the inverse. You can sort of have a color coding also of the inverse, which is also a matrix of integers because these are unimodular uh, multipliers. Then it turns out that uh, uh, that if I take the, 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 the right, the, the top right square matrix and use them as the exponents with my original variables, my transformed variables, uh, uh, then I get a generating set for all rational variables. Okay. Uh, notice that when I, because I've normalized my unimodular uh, multiplier, that in fact these components are all polynomials. So I have a, I have a generating set of polynomial invariants for the set of rational invariants. Okay. And the rewrite rule is if I have anything that, that any other invariant, rational invariant, what I can do is I can take my original variables, Z, and replace them by my invariants now raised to these exponents. And the reason for that is, if you're, do you want me to explain this a little bit more? Maybe, uh, 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 so let's do this theorem and then I'll do an example, illustrate it a little bit. But let me justify it first. Okay. The reason for this is because, in fact, uh, uh, it, it turns out that this, this matrix is really a short complement. Uh, 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 and, and so Vn times this matrix is uh, the identity. And so what happens is any monomial I can write in this form, oops, identity matrix, oh, okay. which means I can take z to the vn and separate it because of the way I played it with exponents. And these are invariants. And so any z to the v can be replaced by this expression. Okay, but remember my uh, 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 rational invariance must be something that takes monomials that look like this okay, and, and adds them up top and bottom, and now they're monomials like this. And so basically, I rewrite this. In, in the scaling symmetry, it's a little bit, a little bit nicer because I don't have this potential, uh, 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 this inverse forces some rational numbers in that. But uh, nonetheless. So it works very nicely, uh, and, and and the proof works that uh, it's kind of obvious. Excuse me. Yeah. What, what does the subscript i in the v so i? Oh, image. Huh? It would be image. Oh, so, image. So 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 really, what you're doing is you're taking your your matrix of exponents, you're finding your Hermit normal form, which is kind of the, so so the, the the Hermit form. The first part is the image. And the second part is the, the, the kernel, or the yeah, nonspace. It's so that's not an index. No, it's not an index. It's, or, or, nor is it a complex number either, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, so no, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's the image. Okay, okay and uh, one of the nice things you can do about this is that, uh, well, uh, I can do things in general with the, uh, for example, if I give you a cyclic group of permutations, 
Uh, I can describe an action really easy. It's just, I can describe the exponents of the action after diagonalizing it, and, and it would be sort of the A is uh, 1, 2, 3, over N minus 1 is 0. That's the matrix that you encounter. It's a single generator of the exponents. I can actually compute the, the normalized, uh, uh, I can actually do the 